when I talk about Africans in Israel, anti-African racism in Israel, um, sometimes what comes up for some people um, is, well, how can you talk about racism against African people if there's African people in Israel, there's African Jews, there's black Jews? How can Israel be racist or anti-black if there's black Jews? And they brought these black Jews out of Africa not to be slaves, but to be free from slavery or to be liberated. And so doesn't that kind of screw up your narrative? So let's talk about African black hats. I'm actually happy to say that this is a story I just broke today. Um, published in a Nigerian journal, Ventures Africa, so it's like a world exclusive, and you're the first people to hear about it <laughs> since the article has been published. So, Operation African Wildass, what is this? So, we know that, just as the Israeli government says, it's true, this part of the story is true. The government did send planes into Ethiopia. They loaded up those planes with Jewish people, and those Jewish people were brought to Israel, and since that time, they've all been living, they and their descendants have been living in Israel as ostensibly citizens of the state, with all that implies. Now, the question you should be asking when you see these photographs is, why are they in color? Because all the other Jewish groups in Israel immigrated much earlier. Israel was established in 1948. Within just a few years, the Jews of Iraq, the Jews of Yemen, the Jews of Jews from all over the world streamed into Israel. You know, the state facilitated the immigration of Jewish communities throughout the world, including countries with which it had no political uh, relations with. So why is it that it took decades to bring the only community or recognized community of sub-Saharan African Jews, of black Jews. Why did that take decades? Well, what the Israeli government says in this, in this case is they said, well, the political conditions of the time did not allow for it. Well, I have a problem with that statement, because I did some digging and I found out that in fact, 10 years previous, I mean, it was in the 1980s when those Ethiopian Jews were brought to Israel. So, but a full decade earlier, 1972, the Israeli government did something very, very similar. Just as in the case of those Jews, they took a plane, uh, 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 you know, a, a Hercules jumbo jet, Israeli Air Force, flew into Ethiopia, landed in the Afari desert region of Ethiopia, and once they got there, they brought Ethiopians on board and flew them back to Israel, and they and their descendants have been living in Israel ever since. But those Ethiopians that they brought on board were not Ethiopian Jews. Who were they? Well, what were they is the actual question that needs to be asked. They were actually Ethiopian donkeys. Now, why would the Israeli government bring Ethiopian donkeys? Israel? Why would the Israeli government spend half a million dollars to purchase 12 Ethiopian donkeys? Well, because of this man. This man was, I guess, uh, an Israeli uh, kind of a pioneer of the conservation movement in Israel. And he had this vision, he had this idea that if we could establish a nature reserve in Israel and we could bring back to life those animals that existed in the time of the Bible. If we go through the Torah and the Talmud and we see the names of the various species and if we could somehow restore the flora and fauna of the time of the Bible and make this, the country look as it did in biblical times, then it would reinforce the Zionist narrative. And then that would give more credence to the idea that Jewish people, just as in days of old, that they should rule the land. And so this was a project that the Israeli government approved, and, and the Israeli Air Force approved, and so they actually brought these donkeys to Israel, and I visited them down in the, in the desert, and they're still, or they and their descendants are living there till this day, you know, frolicking on the flats there, and, um, but what does this teach us? It teaches us that the government was perfectly capable of sending jets in and bringing Ethiopians back to Israel, if they so chose. 
when they wanted to, when it was politically expedient to do so. But they didn't do so with the Jews of Ethiopia until the 80s. Why? Well, we easily understand this from the writings of the Israeli ambassador to Ethiopia at the time. This is Hanani No, the Israeli ambassador to Ethiopia. Here he is giving his... Um, credentials. Exactly. With his which? Credentials. Yes, he's, he's handing in his credentials, presenting his credentials to Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, and he's officially taking on the, the tasks of ambassador. And he writes to his fellow Israeli ambassadors that uh, if they were to allow Ethiopian Jews to visit Israel, it would raise hopes of immigrating for thousands of primitive, illiterate, sick, oppressed people will never have capacity for. Okay? The Israeli government did not want Ethiopian Jews to come to Israel because they were Ethiopians, because they were black, because they were from the so-called third world, developing nations, but especially because they were African. And so, at that time, if you were an Ethiopian Christian, and you wanted to come on a pilgrimage to Israel, you want to see the holy sites, walk where Jesus walked, no problem. You come to the embassy in Addis Ababa, bam, get your stamp on your passport, there you are off on the next plane. However, if you were an Ethiopian Jew, and you wanted to come to Israel and visit the holy sites and see where Moses or Joshua or whatnot walked, then you said, okay, well, we'll give you a, a visa, but it's going to cost you $600, which, of course, it goes without saying, was you know, beyond the means of any Ethiopian at that time, Jewish, Christian, or otherwise. So in this way, um, it, the state of Israel prevented Jewish people from Ethiopia from even visiting the country because they didn't want them to come because they were afraid that they would stay. They didn't want them to stay. They didn't want them in the country because they were black, and so they prevented them from doing so, and that's why none of them came. Now, I think that pretty much dispels this PR, Hasbara line of Israel can't be racist because of Ethiopian Jews. Um, it, the, the last kind of nail in the coffin is the people who did so. The reason why Israel finally changed its mind was not because of any uh, internal you know, realization that it had been wrong all this time. It was because of the persistent efforts of Americans, actually. American Jews uh, started up these groups and they petitioned and they pestered and they, you know, they, they really didn't let up. For years and years, uh, they, they bothered the Israeli government trying to convince them to allow Ethiopian Jews to, to bring them to Israel. Now, admittedly, they were partially motivated by, uh, you know, humanistic concerns, but it must also be said, and we see this from their own writings, they, they weren't bashful about it, the reason, one of their main motives for trying to convince the Israeli government to bring these Ethiopians is because at that time, this is the 1970s, right, so the United Nations passes a resolution declaring that Zionism is a form of racism, that the regime in Israel, as I explained at the beginning, is racist it boycotts its own non-Jewish citizens. So the state is racist, and the UN General Assembly proclaims this, that Zionism is a form of racism. And these American Jewish groups, who they themselves were Zionists, they wanted to protect Israel. They wanted to uh, help its public image. And so they thought that if they brought black Jews to Israel, then they would be able to dispel and shrug off these accusations that Israel was a racist state. And so, at least in part, that's why they lobbied the Israeli government to allow the Ethiopians. They eventually did, but we see that even the initial immigration to Israel of Ethiopians was based on a policy of blackwashing from the very beginning. And it must be said, Ethiopian Israeli people aren't stupid. They realize this. They understand this. They know this. They're not dumb. And so you have um, recently, uh, after a viral video came out of police officers beating in Ethiopia, this is a, 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 an image, a representation of it, but the video, of course, is, 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 uh, is, is, is pretty horrible, but it didn't really need much to kick off these protests because pretty much every Ethiopian man in Israel can tell you either a personal experience or something that happened to their brother or cousin or uncle 
everyone's got a story of police brutality. And this moment was, was like Israel's Trayvon Martin or its Black Lives Matter moment. And so for, you know, the, earlier this year, we saw Ethiopian Israelis in the streets protesting, demanding an end to uh, state racism and police brutalities against the community. And, and you had people protesting in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, blocking 10 lanes of traffic in Israel's largest you know, artery, the Ayalon Highway. It was pretty impressive, especially when you saw the, the, the constituency that came out. It was you know, multi-gender and multi-generational. You had old and young uh, people coming out, which is, is no small thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the, the protest against police brutality was met with police brutalities, uh, and much greater than that which uh, regular old, um, you know, like the, if white people, white Israelis are protesting, they have to face you know, the far uh, less severe police presence and policing, but um, the community was, was uh, these protests were dispersed with great violence, of course. Um, so maybe not akin to what Palestinian people have to experience, it must be said, but certainly more than what Israeli pro white Israeli protesters experience. And um, in the aftermath, you know, people were demanding some kind of government accounting for what had happened, but, you know, since then we see that the government says that the police handled it impeccably, and that, that's the Justice Ministry, and then, of course, police services, they, when called to look into these complaints, they said an in-depth analysis of all the complaints revealed no evidence of discrimination or rights violations. So the struggle continues. Ethiopian people in Israel still struggling, demanding an end to state-sponsored racism against them, but we're, we're, not, we're not really making any headway, especially when the sole Ethiopian Israeli member of the Knesset himself is, is, is such a sellout that he actually voted against, he didn't vote for uh, a state inquiry into these allegations of state racism against Ethiopian people. I mean, it shouldn't have been a shocker. He's a close ally of Netanyahu and Naftali Bennett. But pretty sad that the only African Israeli member of the Knesset would actually vote against an inquiry. Um, so we looked at one Jewish community in Israel and 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 the the, the, the racism it faces and the blackwashing, the, how it's exploited, how the community is exploited. Let's, if we have just a few more moments, if you can hang with me for a few more moments, let's talk about another community in Israel um, that also is uh, exploited. On the basis of its, uh, you know, that supposedly Israel is a safe space for queer people. All right, let's talk about that for a moment. 